That's good. And let me, there we go. All right. Let me switch to slideshow mode and make sure. Can everyone see my screen? Okay. I'm going to try to fly here because I've done, I've presented this content one time internally to our team, but did it in 40 minutes rather than 10. And so I trimmed a lot of things out um, this morning, but I'm going to try to go fast and not get into that awkward. I'm saying too many words a minute and just trying to cram everything in. But quick background on me. I'm COO and co-founder of Spiff. Um, my co-founder and I, this is actually our third company that we've done together. I was talking with the group before this. We started a 409A valuation firm called Scalar. And then our last company was a company called CapShare. And so we've been working on Spiff for five and a half years now. And um, on just on the venture capital and fundraising side, since I think it'll be applicable here, we've raised $120 million for the company across uh, a number of rounds of financing. So it's a little bit of my background. I do all of the finance, legal, um, HR types of things for the business. Also all of the customer support and CS stuff runs up through me as well. So let's jump into the content. So SaaS metrics, venture capital, a little bit of a weird combination here, but I feel like on the venture side, so much of what investors do is SaaS, that having an understanding of just kind of core elements of SaaS helps because you understand what they're often comparing business to. So whether you're a SaaS company or something else, I think having that baseline is useful. So we're going to go through that a little bit, get into the investor um financial model, what how their business really works on their side, and then wrap up with just some high level on the mechanics of the fundraise process. So with that, let's jump in here. So I'm going to start on SaaS. So really quickly with the definition here, not going to read this, but the main components of software as a service is one, you're typically buying on a subscription model. So rather than something that you pay for once and own, at least until you get a new computer or own permanently, something that you, has a recurring fee and is centrally hosted. And that's an important piece as well. It's not something that sits exclusively on your machine. Usually they have a central server that is helping with a lot of the back-end computation type elements. And so at its most simple, those two things are some of the main pieces of SaaS. The reason that this tends to be so good from an investor perspective, and the reason that good chunks of their portfolios are often these software as a service companies is, let me make sure, there we go. So without SaaS, let's say that I own a lemonade stand, and I'll probably come back to our lemonade stand a few times in the presentation here. I make money depending on the number of cups of lemonade that I sell. And so I'm going to be a little bit up and down month to month. That's expected with that business. Um, and so you can see kind of revenue over time in that. With SaaS, I will sell someone once. And then depending on my other metrics, I hypothetically maintain that revenue forever. And so you can see this graph here where each month I will add some new set of sales and then those will continue to pay over time forever. And this becomes incredibly predictable, which makes the revenue very valuable to make it interesting to investors, but also that predictability you can become really, really sophisticated in how you measure that and track it over time. And I mentioned the revenue going forever. You can make the argument, yeah, but what if they stop paying and they churn? And that's absolutely something that to be concerned about. And if we had more time, I could go into kind of multiple metrics on tracking that. 
My favorite though is net revenue retention. It's a metric where if you have 100% net revenue retention, it essentially means that yes, I will churn and lose customers over time, but I'll have other customers that will expand and they'll pay me more money because they add extra seats or they start paying for something else. And so there's things that that expansion will offset the churn. And if you have 100% net revenue retention is how you look at that metric, then this graph would be exactly true where I anything that I close today hypothetically is just going to pay me forever. And that becomes really valuable and predictable. And I would say of the venture capital dollars put to work in the US, my estimate would be that somewhere between 75 and 85% of those are being put to work in SaaS because of elements of this model here. So with that as a background, let's jump over and let's look into things on the venture capital side. And this is, this is something that we often don't go deep on, but I think it's really important as founders, as finance leads to understand this because it influences a lot of the investor mechanics. So this slide is going to be ugly. I apologize in advance. I've got a lot of data kind of crammed into here, but Let's say we've got a VC. So venture capital is the industry that's often abbreviated to VC. That will often refer to the individual investors. So you'll hear things like Susan is a VC. Um, all, they'll also be known as GP or general partner. It applies to a lot of partnerships, but it, that will have that's taken a bit of its own connotation on. Um, on the venture capital side. So I've got this individual, VC or general partner, GP. They're going to raise money on their side from usually this is endowments, large state funds, family offices, groups that are looking to diversify their cash and some subset of that they're looking to put to work in venture capital. These groups, they'll often refer, refer to as LPs or limited partners. Again, this applies to any partnership, but um, it's particularly that LP, GP, um, VC, those are terms that you'll hear thrown around on the investor side. And then investor is going to turn around and invest in multiple companies from that fund that they raised from their LPs. So they'll put that money to work. And a couple notes on their economics here. One, typically a fund has 10 years to put the money to work, grow companies, and then get a return for their investors. And that can flex a little bit, but it's important to note often when I'm talking to folks, that's a surprise. If you're taking money from venture capital, they need an exit within the next 10 years. Usually they'll put that money to work in the first one to three years of the fund life. And then they'll look, work on growing the companies. And then they can flex and push on that 10-year time limit on the back end. But they've got to have good justification to do so. And so a lot of people don't realize when they take on that investment that... Um, they need an exit, they need to pay back their investors. And so you're setting a clock for yourself on your timeline as a business. The other thing that I wanted to call out here, common structure for VC, common structure for VC economics is called two and 20. Those numbers will mean a lot more in the second half of this slide. So we'll come back to those numbers. Let's get into an example though. Let's say that a VC, raises a $100 million fund. The firm will take 2% per year to run their firm as a management fee. So of that $100 million fund, 2 million of that a year is being used to pay analysts on their team, to pay their salaries year to year, to pay for their office space. That's the two 
in this two and 20. And that might shift. There's some funds that will raise on a 1.5 and 15 or some slight change to the economics, but that's their management fee that they use to keep the lights on. The other 80 million they'll invest. Once all of that has been repaid, the first 100 million goes back to their investors. And then beyond that, the partnership, the investors will receive 20% of the profits after that. And that 20%, that's their carried interest. Um, that's the 20 in this, two and 20 here. And so going to this specific example, if the fund made 160 million during the 10 years, they'd first pay back uh, the 100 million and then they'd receive 20% of the remaining 60 or 12 million that goes to the partnership. And that, that's how this business works on the VC side. And so a couple of things that I'd call out I made the comment earlier about the 10 year life as an important thing to understand as entrepreneurs, as you're looking for venture capital funding, you need some sort of liquidity for your investors and need to think through that in your business. And if this is something that you're looking to run for the next 20 years as you know something that stays in your family, there are investors that aren't looking for this, but understanding their economics is important for that and thinking through what you sell them as you're pitching to them. Understanding this, if you're telling a story that has a 20 year life, that's also something that is important to understand because that's going to influence their economics and how they think about the business. So I know I'm blowing through here. I imagine we'll need to circle back on a couple questions in the Q&A here, but I want to jump into the fundraise process a little bit. And any of these topics we could go on for hours. Part of what I wanted to hit on the conversation today are just some of the mechanics that for me at least were places where I misstepped early on raising money um, because I didn't know the structure. And so I just came across as a little bit naive on some of these topics. And so I'm not going into what an ideal pitch looks like, things like that. I just want to talk about some of those stumbling blocks on the actual mechanics. So first off, let's talk about the fundraise process itself. And the comparison that is most applicable widely that I've seen is selling a house. So when you go through fundraise process, there'll be an initial fundraise process. The signed term sheet will indicate that you've selected one group who's going to lead your round. And there may be other investors that participate in that, but you're looking for a lead as part of this fundraise process. You'll select one key lead, specify largely all of the main business metrics, and then go into a due diligence process before the money's actually wired. And using the house comparison, during this process, this is where you're showing a house. You've got a lot of people walking through your house, exploring. You're talking to a lot of different groups and you're pushing towards um, offers. You'll then select one of those offers, which is the same as this kind of signed term sheet. And then it's due diligence. And you're really working with one intended buyer to make sure that they have a chance to verify that there's no mold and the foundation is good and all of the pipes work as expected before actually signing the 200 page mortgage um, docs and everything and closing on the sale process. This is very, very similar between the different processes here. So a couple of things that I would call out on here. One, probably the most important, if you take anything away from this, is it's generally smart to go out aggressively and keep this process relatively short. Um, similar to selling a house, if you can get multiple offers that you can kind of push against each other and get the best deal possible from the investor that you want to work with, it's helpful and relies on keeping a short process. That's hard to do because you'll get 
interest from the investor side over, over time. If you can keep them warm, let them know you're not fundraising today, keep a relationship, check back in with them. Um, then when you actually go out, having a number of those groups that you can spin up all at the same time, clearing your calendar so that this isn't a side hobby for six months, but is really what you're focusing on during the fundraise process will ultimately help with the economics from the raise. And then you'll go into a diligence process. This will look very different depending on the stage um, that you're at as a business. Um, so they'll vary from early stage. It's a lot of understanding you, understanding your vision to later stage. You're really talking metrics and it's feeling the people that are reviewing on the other side feel more and more like iBankers and are really, really focused on just the metrics of the business. And so that varies over time. It's a lot of legal and financial um, during this process. Last thing that I wanted to hit, again, on just the mechanics and helping to know going into the conversation what's going to be the most valuable um, and what some of the terminology that the investors will use. I want to talk through pre-money versus post-money valuation. Um, and this is my last slide, and then we'll jump into Q&A here. But let's say you're starting a lemonade stand. You have an investor willing to give you a million for 25%. How much does that indicate the company's worth today? And the quick answer that I'll often get here is $4 million, which to a sense is absolutely true. But that $4 million does need to be split between the million dollars they're giving you and what the rest of the business is worth. And so $4 million, yes, that's true. But if the million represents 25% of this, then the other 75% that existed before is the $3 million. And that gives you pre-money valuation is the term or pre-money and post-money valuation or post-money. You'll hear those terms used. And the reason this is so important is investors, when they start to talk about valuation, they're generally talking pre-money valuation in this. And by thinking about it as pre-money valuation and then an amount raised on top of that, you don't have to do this like cyclical math of depending on how much you raise, determines what the business is worth. You can talk about what's this business worth today. And then you can talk about how much you're going to raise because this can change. And if you solidify this, knowing that you're going to raise 750K to 1.5 million, you can have two separate valuable conversations without needing to combine them because this will vary even late stage as you're filling out who are the other investors who are going to come in? Um, this number can change, which means the post-money valuation will change. But being able to talk pre-money specifically with investors helps to have a more productive conversation. And that's generally what they're used to doing. So I know I just word vomited at everyone and dropped on a lot of different topics, but I will end there and I'm guessing I might've missed a question or two in the chat. And so if anyone wants to help me out on that side, but happy to talk through kind of any questions from here. Awesome, Matt, thanks so much. This is super cool. Um, I put a question in the chat, but also happy to take anyone else's questions if you want to either unmute yourself or put it in the chat. Um, but yeah, this was a great kind of foundation for us, Matt. Um, really appreciate it. Yeah, as, thanks, David. As you're, uh, I'll jump in with the first question. As you're looking at those valuations and taking into account then the metrics that you were talking about on the first slide, how are you looking at, how are you combining those two between the metrics that a SaaS company is looking at in terms of ARR, recurring revenue, versus the valuation of the company, how have you yeah. found those to mesh? So 
And let me actually, and I'm gonna exit so that I can hop around here. So the one thing that I would say is in school, they teach you academic valuation methods. And so they'll they'll teach you these discounted cash flow models where you take all of those things and you turn it into a valuation over time. Um, venture valuation is a lot of negotiation. And so it's much more squishy and qualitative than you would expect if you have a finance background coming out of school. The one heuristic that tends to come through the most is depending on the business again, and I'll speak to SaaS specifically, but ARR, annually recurring revenue, um, usually there's some sort of multiple being applied to that. And that will vary depending on the business, anywhere from a services business, it might be half of your annual revenue is a valuation. For SaaS, it tends to be more 5X to 120X, depending on negotiation and how interested groups are. And I know that's a ridiculous range. I do that on purpose because I've seen companies accept a 5X multiple to only have an investor come in later and say like, no, we'll give you 10X to then have an investor come in later and say, no, we'll give you 40X. A lot of this is just negotiation depending on how interested people are. Interesting. So um, that multiple on ARR, Taylor, I would say is the most telling heuristic. Great. That's helpful. Uh, Jordan just put in the chat, I'm pitching for the first time soon. Do investors expect to show them you to show them explicitly what their exit options are or can it remain implicit? It can absolutely remain implicit. The one thing I would say is being naive to the fact that they need an exit can be harmful to your process. And so I've found I'll often, we just raised around four or five months ago and letting them know like, look, we're not dogmatic on an IPO. There's, there's certain acquisitions from in our space, it would be CRM or ERP groups, but letting them know that we're aware of the need without necessarily saying this will be the exit. Cause being too specific, um, that can be unrealistic as well. So I think just being aware of it's important. Let's see, other questions? Um, I think, I a yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I, I basically do a, like top of funnel lead generation for a lot of startups. And I always tell them, um, if you have good revenue, good MRR, ARR, TCB, ACV, your money's going to be cheaper versus mm -hmm. saying, I got this great idea. Here's my MVP and I think I can make money. And here's my, uh, here's my tech flow. So I was just curious because I'm not an investor. I'm not even close to understanding half the stuff you said, but it's awesome. How much does that affect um, the cost of money and the availability of money that you have momentum, revenue, path? So I would say it depends, it depends on the stage. And I might jump, jump to here where I say like this focus line, you can see that when you're raising a seed round, a lot of it is storytelling. And, yeah. you know, so there's a lot of storytelling there. A lot of it, like my last company, we never really got behind the, beyond the series seed. And getting 100K from an investor was just pulling teeth. Um, with Spiff, we'd sold our last company for $20 million. And I raised $3 million on a napkin um, because they'd seen that background and they were more confident in the story piece. And so at that side, things change. But what you're talking about, I'd say especially come Series A, the types of metrics that you're talking about Series A, they want to know that you're thinking about how your go-to-market process works and that you're starting to come up with opinions about how much pipeline you need and what that pipeline is going to convert at. And eventually you get to the point where it's all metrics and that's all that matters. 
is what you're describing and you know additional additional metrics beyond that but there's an instrumentation process that i think happens naturally as you mature but that traction showing that you know what you're talking about showing that you've got confidence on what will happen tomorrow and you've got justification for that that's always going to make your money cheaper thank you matt and it and it does for two reasons one it helps them be more confident in the business model two it makes them more confident in you as a founder um and that confidence in you is going to be impactful as well you, Matt. I have an additional question for you, Matt. Uh, I am That's in a similar boat as Jordan, where we're just getting started on diving into this entire space. And there are basically an alphabet soup style when it comes to metrics, so many different areas and considerations. I'm wondering, do you have any recommended readings, anything that you think is a good place to start for somebody who's trying to learn just how to speak the same language as everybody else? Oh, that is a good question. Um, I mean, in general, understanding, and I will, I'll work with Hannah and Taylor to make the deck available. Um, I would say I did include some kind of glossary of metrics that just understanding these metrics, I would say would be super valuable. One thing as well on some of these metrics, especially like some of the sales efficiency metrics, um, those change and certain metrics go in and out of vogue. And that makes that even harder. But these, based on our process in the last few months, I think these are the ones that investors are talking about most on that side. Now, depends on the stage of company and like things like magic number only matter if you're post revenue and you've got that in place but we'll share that and make that available um on the reading side i'm trying to think through my favorite that i would point you at and trying to remember if it comes to me i will throw it back down back out i'm scrolling through my audible right now just trying to remind myself of the book that I want. Matt, Jeff Erickson suggested Zero to One by Peter Thiel and Venture Deals by Brad Feld. Which are both both awesome. The one I was looking for, I love From Impossible to Inevitable. It's another really, really solid one that I'd suggest. It's by Aaron Ross and Jason Munkin. And I did see get backed in there as well in the chat. So thank you to everybody who's dropping books in there for me. Yeah. I haven't read Impossible to Inevitable. That's on my list now. Thank you. Um, one last question anybody have before we uh, close up shop for the day? Okay, then it's up to me. Matt, if you were to give suggestions to people raising funds, what, what would you, what are one to three kind of headlines that you would say people should remember or make sure that they're doing as they're starting the fundraising process? I would say, I think the two that I would give, I made that comment about trying to go out to market with a bang, going all at once, hitting the market hard, not making it a side job. Sometimes that's not possible, but I found that to be really, really important. The other that I would say, and it's, it's challenging to find all the time, but find someone who's raised a meaningful amount of money in a similar space and get their feedback and have done it in the last five years and get their feedback and iterate on that. And then as many warm conversations as you can have before that, like, all right, we're in, 
going out to market, we're hitting it hard. We're working 18 hours a day on just kind of staying on top of conversations. Any warm conversations that you can have with that investor uncle of yours or your friend that raised, you know, a series A last year or something, those are going to be really, really meaningful. And I saw, I saw a comment early on. I just wanted to throw out my emails, matt at spiff.com. Feel free to hit me up um, there or hit me up on LinkedIn. Um, I know this is largely a Utah group. I never reject Utah connections on that site as well. So that's another way. If you've got any questions, I'm happy to chat there. Awesome. Thanks, Matt. Really appreciate your time, Matt. This was fantastic. And yes, we'll get, we'll get, um, Hannah will get with you on getting this presentation so that we can share it with the group. This is super valuable. Um, again, can't thank you enough for your time. And I would encourage everybody to reach out and connect with, with Matt, if you've got some additional questions. Um, but other than that, thanks everybody for joining and we'll be, we'll be back here same time next week. Look forward to seeing everyone. Have a great week. Thanks all.